It is January 8th, 2020. Uh, Happy New Year, listeners. Uh, we have not done a recording of a Mormon Stories podcast episode since November of 2019. Um, December of 2019 was a great month. We actually moved out of our previous Mormon Stories podcast studios in downtown Salt Lake, and we moved into what we're now calling the Mormon Stories podcast slash Thrive Up studio here in Holiday, Utah. It's it's closest close to my house. But we're super excited to have Natasha Helfer Parker move in um, to this facility. She's providing mental health services. She, along with Symmetry Solutions, we are now, um, you know, uh, launching the Thrive Center, which is a community center for uh, post Mormons and progressive Mormons to get together, to support each other, to do um, faith crisis support groups, to do growth groups, books, book clubs, studies, potlucks, whatever we're going to do. We're so excited to be in this new space. Huge thanks to Clint, Jenny Martin, and uh, Tyler Alden, and many others for helping us move in here. Um, but that kind of made December not a super productive month for us. We also kind of just needed a break. Um, but it is now the new year, and we're in our new studios. We've got a lot of cool, exciting things coming up. And we're really excited to be back in the saddle because I've missed uh, doing these interviews. Hope you have too. So uh, we are here on January 8th to, to launch um, Mormon Stories for another year, and uh, I'll be talking soon about the new strategy that we have for 2020, what you can expect, et cetera. Um, but today we're going to just focus on a really interesting interview, or at least the first part of a really interesting interview. We'll see how far we get. Um, today we're interviewing... Uh, Joe Tibbetts, and I don't expect many of you to know who Joe is, but uh, Joe's got a really interesting story because Joe uh, was raised Mormon in Sandy, Utah. Um, his dad was a CES director, uh, CES, you know, seminary institute teacher. Uh, Joe served a mission, uh, was a very faithful Mormon until at some point he uh, had a crisis of faith or uh, a crisis in belief in some way. We'll get into that. And uh, a few years ago, he resigned his membership from the church. And, uh, you know, he's learned all the stuff in the CES letter, all the stuff that Mormon Stories talks about, all the stuff that, you know, people who struggle with the church claims, he knows all that stuff. Uh, he fully was resigned and out. Um, and for, for a few years, he was out of the church. And then he uh, had some experiences that, that led him to get rebaptized. And now he is a f member in, in good standing um, in his ward. He's in a mixed faith marriage or or a sort of a mixed faith marriage. We'll talk about that. Um, but he he's back in the church again. Um, I would say as a progressive or nuanced believer, but we'll let him characterize himself. And um, Joe has a passion now that he's back in building bridges between. Orthodox Mormons, Progressive Mormons, and Post-Mormons. So uh, it's going to be a really interesting story, and we're super we're super excited to have you here. So Joe Tippett's welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. Did I get everything right? or Pretty much. We'll iron it out. Okay. Yeah. Um, huge thanks, shout out to my dear friends, Jeff and Chelsea Gardner, who uh, made us aware of Joe. They're dear friends of Joe's, and we're grateful um, to the gardeners and we give them a shout out and say, Hey guys, we love you guys. Um, all right. So, uh, we have 115 people joining us live on the live stream. That's super exciting. Uh, part of the reason why we do this is so that we can get your feedback and input. So if any of you have questions or comments or concerns or compliments that you want to share throughout this episode, I'll be monitoring the comments and we would love um, to be able to incorporate your comments and questions into this episode. So thanks for joining us. And uh, all right, Joe. So um, let's just do just a few minutes on kind of your uh, the Mormon credibility sort of uh, background. Mormon cred scale? Your Mormon cred scale. Like <laughs> what, what boxes do you check on the Mormon cred scale and, and what boxes do you not check? Oh, I pretty traditional. Um in the past, things that uh, were on that cred scale may have seemed more important to me now. Um, 
I'm not as interested in listing off the callings I may have had or, uh, you know, I, I think my story is like a lot of people who have already shared their story, um, grew up in a faithful, loving home, grew up with a very traditional belief, um, married in the temple, and, um, you know, for uh, love the church well into adulthood. Um, it was a central driving, the central driving factor. And when I say the church, I also mean Christ because I wouldn't have distinguished those two in my mind. Um, and so uh, I think in terms of uh, the Mormon cred scale, I, I took that test a, while, a few years ago, and and uh, I think everybody in my family is pretty high in terms of having a, a typical Utah Mormon experience, and you know, going through the through the youth programs and into adulthood. So um, your. As I understand it, your dad was a CES director, you know, church education system, seminary institute teacher. And I would guess that's a pretty orthodox home, maybe even more orthodox than normal. Now, that's just a, an assumption on my part. Tell, tell me how many siblings you had and tell me uh, to what extent your, your home was extra turbocharged Mormon or not <laughs> because your dad was in CES. Yeah, the word... Um... Orthodox, I would associate with saying mainstream. You're a mainstream believing family, and uh, turbocharge is a good word, but not in the sense you might think, because for some people, turbocharge Mormonism means extra strict. And um, I wouldn't characterize my home that way at all. Um, with my parents, it was always a very loving version of Mormonism for me. Different siblings may have a different experience, but I had, I'm had i one of five siblings. Uh, my oldest brother, Scott, passed away in 2000, um, and so there are four of us now, and, um, you know, we were raised in a home where every Sunday at dinner and every night at dinner, practically, my dad was coming home from work excited to tell about things he had talked to his class about. Um, and he would be very excited for Mondays rather than Fridays. He loved his work. And I think that rubbed off on us. Um, I always felt in my home that my parents were open to um, exploration, uh, new ideas. Um, like we were talking earlier at lunch, my dad was always the guy, he had the NIV Bible or the, he would read from a variety of Christian authors, um, not just LDS authors. He was well-read and, and that was really important to him. And he, he did, and he does, uh, love to study, be a scholar of the gospel. And, uh, so I think that kind of characterizes my home life growing up. Okay, but so, so I think sometimes when those of us who grew up in the '80s and '90s, maybe we might associate seminary institute teachers with like Bruce R. McConkie, Joseph Fielding Smith type Mormons, super strict, super worried about sexual things, like really doctrinaire. Followed Bruce R. McConkie. Was that your dad? No, but. Um... There's a but there. He was, he was as loyal and is both of my parents because sometimes the dad with the position in CES gets talked about. Uh, my mom right there with him, loving, good, faithful, believing parents that did not teach the gospel through guilt and shame and uh, rules in the home that that you had to obey or there were going to be consequences. It, it always just felt like uh, very much a, um, especially into my late teenage years, the gospel was something we loved. And, um, and we did it because we wanted to. And, and so it never felt like a uh, kind of a military type dad situation commanding the home. It, 
it was always um, the church wasn't something I can remember when I was 11 or 12 standing out front in uh, our driveway and it was about time for church and I was mad and I said to my dad I hate the church it's so stupid and he didn't blow up or anything or he didn't ground me um I don't even remember much about the response because it wasn't strong. It was more just kind of, that's nice. Sounds like something an 11 year old would say, get in the car, let's go to church. <laughs> and so um, I, I think that's the tone of the way I was raised. So not a strict dad. No. Not a harsh religious experience. No, and very obedient and wanting to very much... Uh, be anxiously engaged in, I guess you could say, in, in the church, um, but not in a negative way. It was more him sharing his, his enthusiasm um, for it and it kind of rubbing off on us. My brother, Steve, if he's watching he or is. now or later. He, he gave a shout out. Um, he, Hi, might, Steve. he might be kind of laughing at this and want to chime in on what I'm saying, but... Uh, in terms of trying to characterize it big picture, that's how it felt to me. Um, and would you, would you, do you think looking back that for the time your dad was unorthodox? Was he kind of progressive? Did he like know about Sunstone and dialogue? Did he know about church history? Like, oh yeah. Had, was his approach seasoned or tempered by an awareness of the things that now we all find problematic basically? Um, he was, raised in a home where his dad and mom weren't active. So he didn't have this notion of a perfect family and trying to maintain an appearance of, of a perfect family. He had siblings that hadn't wanted to be involved in the church since they were young. And the whole Tippett's family, you know, we all just loved each other. There wasn't a divide between... There was obviously a recognition that some were members and some weren't. And I remember writing some letters as a missionary, kind of trying to convert my grandparents, or I probably sent some things like that to maybe a couple of aunts. Um, but, you know, he was the guy who, I remember seeing Sunstone Magazine in his briefcase when I was a kid. And now, would this have been in the 80s or 90s? Uh, late 80s, okay. uh, mid to late 80s. Um, so pre-September 6th. At the time, it just seemed like kind of a churchy thing. I didn't know much about it. But looking back and understanding what Sunstone is now, I can see, uh, I feel like um, my dad has always wanted to be in a position to understand multiple viewpoints, to be in a position to talk about those things intelligently, to try to understand people and empathize with them. Um, he's a... <laughs> Anybody who knows him um, knows he's a, he's a good, kind person. And uh, I remember when I started at the, inst at the University of Utah, he was the I believe the director of the institute at that time, and um, and I would go sometimes to study in the institute library, and he would talk about he would part of his job was he got to order books in the library, and he would order books like God Makers and you know things that were anti Mormon books, and I remember asking him why would he order things like that as part of the institute library, and he he wanted to be aware of. Um, I guess, arguments people were making uh, against the church or criticisms about the church. Um, and I think he did it in such a way that I never felt, it, it never felt like forbidden fruit at that time in my life, like something I wanted to go search. It just seemed like uh, those were a bunch of angry people writing bad things about my true church and... Uh, but looking back, it, you know, in in his own way, I I think he was, um, 
I, I would just call them very open to um, trying to have a good understanding of what a lot of people are thinking. And this is getting a little bit geeked out, but the University of Utah, to me, is kind of famous because it would have been where Lowell Benyon would have served uh, as an institute teacher for many, many years, maybe T. Edgar Lyon, uh, maybe Marion D. Hanks, I'm not sure, but like a lot of these sort of 1960s, 50s, 60s, 70s sort of Mormons that were actually lovers of science, lovers of truth. Um, sometimes they were ahead of their time in terms of civil rights. So the University of Utah plays an important role in intellectual Mormon history and development, the institute there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think there's a Lowell Benyon Center for Humanitarian Service at the U now or something yeah. like that. Do you know if your dad would have been in, inspired or influenced by any of those? I would have been men? pretty young at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking through the Institute. The Institute um, played an important role. <laughs> I'm a really emotional guy. So <clears throat> um, just be ready for it because um, the Institute's a special place for me. Um, but uh, I remember seeing some of the the pictures throughout the building that had some of those old familiar kind of names you had heard of within Mormonism. Um, and uh, so I, I'm sure my dad, I, I think they were the generation a little bit older than my dad, and I think he would have been uh, looking up to them as, um, as kind of mentors. I don't know how much he personally interacted with them. Um, what when you think about uh, the the institute at the U of U and get teary eyed, can you let people know what that place was like? What it meant to the students there? Like I I remember reading about ping pong games there and <laughs> and just a lot of dances and social life and it, a real hub for college age kids trying to balance thought and faith. What, what do you remember about it? What what oh, makes yeah. you get teary eyed about it? <clears throat> Um, I think maybe because my dad worked there, uh, maybe the faculty had a little bit of, uh, took notice of me more than they might everybody. I don't know. But my first day there, I was going to go to Rick's college. Uh, a friend and I in high school were going to room together. And then in the end, I decided to go to the University of Utah. And, and uh, none of my close friends were there with me. And... Uh, I just remember the first day in the cafeteria there. This was the old institute building, that the white brick kind of building that used to be there. And uh, the thing that um, I think about when that causes that kind of emotional response, Brother Openshaw, everybody called him Brother O. He was the choir director. And uh, he just came up to me and he kind of tapped me on the shoulder. He's a really big guy. He said, you Larry's boy? Yeah, you're in the choir. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, kind of excited. And um, that was, we were just a really close-knit group. It, it gave me, it's, the church does that in so many ways. It gives you an instant group of people you can become close with, whether it's moving from high school to college or, um, you know, when we finished school and moved up to Seattle, you don't feel concern about um, meeting people because you know you're going to meet your ward and instantly have some things in common. And, and that's kind of the Institute and being part of that choir was a pretty special experience. That was kind of the hub of my social life there for the first two years of college. I just got a, a, a comment from my dear friend, Zan smith Herb, who says, this is interesting to listen to because her dad was also a teacher at the University of Utah Institute. So shout out to Zan and Brady and uh, <laughs> all those who have fond memories of the University of Utah Institute. Yeah. Let's go back just a bit because I've talked, uh, oh, and also Marlene writes, I love that choir and the fun performances we saw you and wife in. So do you know Marlene? My mother-in-law, yes. Miyasaki? Yeah. Hi, Marlene. Thanks for joining us. You got the family. You got the family tuned in. Oh, totally. It's so nice. <laughs> um, and uh, shout out to Steve too, um, and Wayne Miyasaki. Lots of lots of friends and family tuning in. Um, welcome. So, 
talking to Jeff Gardner a little bit about your background, and let's just go back a little bit before college, but basically he makes it sound like you had a little bit of a rebellious streak or a <laughs> precocious streak. And he talked about you being a little bit of a, he would probably say troublemaker or something to that effect. And then you getting called uh, as, as a seminary president in your high school. Can you yeah. talk about like, whatever those crazier days were, is Jeff exaggerating? <laughs> Did you have a rebellious streak or a, like a, a little prodigal time? And then is, is that, was that a thing for you where it was like a big change where you went from whatever you were to like seminary class president at your high school? And did that, did the, was there a transformation in faith that happened at all during that time? Um, he w I think he was saying it kind of jokingly, um, just being preteens and teenagers together through, through scouting and, um, you know, maybe always wanting to joke around, um, but um, definitely the uh, uh, the years. Uh, let's see, when I would have been a, a especially a so well more a junior sophomore year in high school. Um, um, at that point, I knew some of the teachers at the Alta High School Seminary because they were friends with my dad, um, like John Hassler. And then, um, I don't know if you remember 80s BYU basketball with uh, oh, yeah. Marty, Marty Haas. Marty Haas, Andy Toulson, Jeff Chapman. Yeah. And there was... Michael Smith, uh, Jim Yusevich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there was, there was uh, a special group of teachers at, uh, at that seminary. One of them was uh, Kelly Haas. Um, and I think a lot of Is us... Is that Marty's dad? Uh, his brother. Oh, okay. A lot of us at first learned that he was Marty Haas' brother, and so suddenly he was cool. But then we soon discovered that he was uh, pretty special on his own, um, independent of his brother. But uh, That BYU basketball team rose to second in the nation, yeah, <laughs> and it was an amazing year, and several went on to play pro ball. It was a great... 87, Yeah, that was you know the year I was a freshman at BYU. Was that when they lost to Clemson? Who had the twin towers and Marty Haas missed that layup, Maybe. that catch and shoot. Maybe. We were watching it in Kelly Haas, the teacher's uh, classroom, uh, one of those years. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, that junior year, Diane Doan, another teacher there at the seminary, um, it, it was special there. These, these teachers had a way of connecting with people and... Um, Um, to those of you who have left the church and are watching me having my little drama session here and rolling your eyes, please bear with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't help this. Um, these are special people to me. And um, um, so uh, the junior year in, in high school, I think that's the year I kind of converted where church wasn't just something my family did, but it was something I, I was loving. And, um, and then at the end of that year, um, I was called as seminary president and, um, you know, I think it's about April that they call you for the next year to kind of have a transition with the, with the other seminary council. And I was blown away because I wasn't a kid that was real popular or anything in high school. I kind of had my little group of friends and um, uh, getting that, being put in that position, you know, they put your picture up with the other seminary council members in the, and um, at least in Utah, it gives you kind of a status. And people I didn't know um, throughout the high school, which was really big at the time, it was over 3,000 students, um, would just say hi to me in the hall. Hey, Joe. And um, uh, I just felt um, 
<clears throat> I wanted to bring people into a circle. I wanted to become the guy that said hi to that kid that nobody else was saying hi to. Um, and being in that position made it, you know, where where people wanted to be around me. And suddenly it, it kind of puts you in an inside group and you have a little bit of status among your peers. Um, and uh, that was a that was a very shaping experience for me, um, just to kind of be thrust into that position and and to grow into it and move past the stage of feeling intimidated by it and and moving into where I was uh, I really loved trying to um, be a friend to everybody. I I think that's the biggest thing I saw is my job as just, and it was very sincere. It wasn't this kind of sales sense of, of, um, wanting to enroll more kids in seminary or something. It was, um, it was having an eye for those people that, uh, that just kind of look lonely. <clears throat> And knowing I had an ability to pull them into something um, where uh, they could feel important. And I, I loved doing that. Um, I, I was a crier then, too. <laughs> so if anybody from the old seminary council happens to see this, they'll know I'm, uh, I, I've been this way for a long time. <laughs> Uh, several listeners are being very uh, encouraging about your display of emotion. Ginger writes, don't apologize. Um, <laughs> she says, don't apologize for being emotional. Some of us didn't have a bad upbringing in the church and have nothing but positive memories. Yeah. Victoria writes, hey, Victoria. Um, Victoria writes, your emotions are totally understandable. The church means a great deal to you. We understand and are grateful for your honesty and vulnerability. Thanks, Victoria, for the support. Uh, Ali writes, no eye rolls here. I am glad you had a great experience. Um, Tammy writes, I would be a sobbing mess, I'm sure, talking <laughs> about my childhood, etc. So lots of support. Um, Good. Okay, so, uh, and that's, for me, that's, that, that is exactly a, a strain of the Mormonism that I just loved. It's, mm -hmm. I, I always remember in seminary and watching those films about being kind to people and cipher in the snow, the, you know, and find the people that are lonely, go visit the grandparents and yeah. find the kid in school that's lonely and make them feel good. And don't ever leave, you know, if there's a wallflower and they call them the girls wallflowers, if they weren't dancing, go find the girls that aren't dancing and go dance with them and make them feel good. Like, and I apologize for any feminists that take umbrage at sort of the way that we were taught back then. But I mean, for me, that's a very beautiful part of Mormonism, which yeah. is just, Try, teach you people to be Christ-like, basically. Kind, compassionate, loving, especially to the sad or the marginalized or the downtrodden, right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not jumping ahead. I just want to contrast it for one second with, um, say, you're two, three years out of Mormonism, and you've, um, you've had to describe to yourself, what do all those things mean to me now? And... Um, Uh, you can get a a pretty cynical um, you can it, it can be easy to shut off your emotions because it's really painful to leave. And my wife was just commenting to me the other day um, that for quite a few years I didn't show emotion. I think I felt kind of numb and I think there's probably a lot of people who can relate with that where you you get so overwhelmed with so much emotion for so long that you kind of shut off and um, and you have to learn to kind of reconnect with those emotions. But when you feel like those emotions have been manipulated um, and you feel like people have used emotions to to get you to think a certain way you can become really distrusting of emotions and, and emotional uh, experiences. 
Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. I just wanted to contrast it with, you know, right now I can look back at those things and wholly appreciate them again. But for a long time, I felt like I had to have a little distance, like Brother Haas was a great man, but whatever that but was. And it's kind of sad because there were great people in our lives, whether we whether the church works for us now or not. At least I hope for many of us. Love it. Steve says that uh, we get our emotions from Wayne. That's what Steve <laughs> says. Is that true? Is that your dad? My grandpa. Oh, your grandpa. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I assume you served a mission and, and got married in the temple and that sort yeah. of thing. Any important parts of those stories, or are they pretty typical missions and temple marriages kind of thing? Um, uh, I, I served in Chile. Ooh, and uh, that's, that's an issue because <laughs> that would have been during the massive baptism sort of uh, years where some missions were baptizing a thousand a month, like the Vina del Mar mission, just huge we, egregious over baptisms that the church had to uh, undo, which meant they closed 30 stakes. I mean, I don't know if listeners have ever checked out my interview with Ted Lyon, um, who is a temple president and an MTC president and a mission president in Chile, mm-hmm. but those years, Chile had serious problems in, in the missionary work. Did you experience that? Um, I experienced some of the dynamic you're talking about in terms of the huge emphasis on numbers. hitting baptism numbers. Yeah. I remember it was normal for us to have a a, a monthly baptism uh, goal of five people per companionship, um, and I think it was around 400 for the whole mission. And... Um, and there was there were times where we had a mission newsletter each month, and it was kind of like a sales newsletter, where you would see the pictures of the top baptizers, and it was kind of implied that those were the most righteous, closest to God missionaries, because that's how they're baptizing. And then sometimes you rub shoulders and realize that, um, not in every case, but in some cases, it just kind of felt like people who are wanting to run up the numbers to, to look good. Um, even with that, um, it, it, you know, it was a, it was a very important experience for me. Life changing. I loved it. I still on Facebook am able to keep touch, uh, for a long time. (coughs) There were, For a long time, there were people, um, while I was out of the church, um, that uh, a lady I baptized, <laughs> she would call me elder in her comments when I would put something on Facebook, or querido elder, you know, beloved elder. And um, it would just kind of make me have mixed feelings because I loved her, I love her, <laughs> and yet having her call me elder kind of bugged me for a while, but I didn't want to correct her either because that's the context where we met. And, um, hi Ines Fuentes, if you're watching. Um, but, uh, getting back to the, the mission experience, um, for the, for a few months I served in the mission office as the secretary, um, that's where I kind of got my head into the computers and it really shaped the direction of my career. I'm a software engineer. Um, and, uh, I, I could talk for a long time about that, but overall a great experience like many of you have had, whether you're in or out of the church. And when you, when you came home from your mission and did you, you went to the U? Yeah. And assuming you met your wife there? Yeah, we were in a in the institute choir together, and we were in a singles branch together in Sandy. Um, so both places. And you guys were married what year? Ninety seven. In which temple? Uh, Salt Lake. Okay. We were traditional. Twenty three years on the seventeenth uh, of this month, next Friday. Okay, tell me again what year. 97. 97. Okay. Yeah. So four years after Morgan and I get married. All right. I'm getting the decade about. I'm, a, yeah. I'm about to join Microsoft. Um, <laughs> so uh, were you pretty orthodox 
would you would you looking back characterize yourself as pretty traditional orthodox uh, Very when, much when you so. got married? Yeah. More than I, your dad, maybe? I want to parse out that word orthodox because it can be used as a weapon and it can be used... Um, before I had gotten into the ex-Mormon world, the word orthodox, you, you've often mentioned that book uh, about Asher Lev. My name is Asher Lev. Kaim Potok, and I, yeah. And I loved the Kaim Potok books and and it would it, they were based around these orthodox Jewish communities in Brooklyn or whatever. And so orthodox always seemed like kind of a word applied to maybe Jews or other yeah, people. Yeah, Mormons don't use that word. Yeah, it w- was yeah. only in the ex-Mormon world where orthodox, it was kind of TBM, a synonym for TBM, which true blue Mormon yeah. or true believing Mormon. Right. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it's used as kind of a way to say, oh, they're orthodox, like... Pejorative. Yeah, they're weird. They're Bad, so committed, or, yeah. they don't see reason. And um, so back to your question, was I orthodox? I, the church was my whole identity, and I loved it. Um, everything about my life was about the church and God. And, um, you know, I wanted to get married quickly because that interview with your mission president before you go, you had a little different experience with your mission, but, um, you know, the go get married. And then right when I got home, my stake president, the first calling he gave me was to date, to go on a date with a, a girl that had gotten home from her mission that week. And, um, you know, so marriage was in my mind, I'm going to move on. And I wanted to be an achiever. Um, and so, uh, it was straight into, you know, singles ward and then, uh, marriage and, um, temple and then you know having kids right away in our stake in our student stake um that was emphasized it get married and and don't postpone having kids and um it, you know so we tried to do all those things and we didn't do it with a sense of sacrifice we did it with a sense of zeal yeah um i've heard you enough you know what i'm talking yeah. about yeah and um uh, it, it was just, it was my life and it was a joy. Yeah. And so, you know, we would have these bishopric meetings up at the U and the student ward. And because of everybody's busy schedule, we would start at 9 p.m. on Wednesday night and go till midnight. And 90% of the meetings was just trying to shuffle people into new callings because we were constantly getting tons of new people in and out of the ward. And, um, you know, I just remember feeling like it was... That's what I wanted to do my whole life. Um, when I when we moved to Seattle after I graduated, Renton, um, same thing. The ward was a place to, you know, I was serious about this temple covenant. It wasn't this sideshow thing you did to get through the temple. That was at the center. Like, I won't repeat the things in the temple because I know it's sacred, but you all know the commitments that are made in the temple. And to me, that was very literal. And things like even my career, um, those were all just kind of a means to an end. The big thing on my mind was building the kingdom. And um, that's just what was important. So is there anything about your story that you want to tell before we get into what went wrong and what <laughs> what caused you to, to leave the church? No, we've said enough. Okay. You have a feel for how, yeah, how yeah. I was. You were in. You were true blue all yeah. the way, going for the celestial kingdom. And, yeah. and it, it sounds like in a way that was love-based and kindness-based and yeah. all the right types of Mormon, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. So what happened? <laughs> well, at, what, when did the cracks start developing? Uh, I think the first crack started in in Renton. Uh, we had a lot of that's in Washington, right by Seattle, uh, the yeah. suburb of Seattle. Yeah. Um, we had a great ward up there, and uh, we had a lot of immigrant families moving in to the area. We had some apartment complexes in the ward that where uh, 
there were a lot of Mexican families and um, we started reaching out <clears throat> with, um, you know, thing at ESL. We started having an ESL class at the church and my wife and another lady um, uh, ran this ESL class and very quickly suddenly it went from having five people to having 20 people there every week. And then suddenly, you know, we were having activities and uh, I and some other people who, especially who spoke Spanish, were um, very enthusiastic about uh, meeting these families. They were receptive to us. Um, and um, and a lot of people started getting baptized in that ward, in, Rent, in the Renton Highlands ward. And, um, but soon we started seeing a challenge that, uh, a lot of them were undocumented and, and they were in, some of them were in some tough situations, whether it was financial or otherwise. And, uh, in our ward council meetings each Sunday morning, we'd be talking about how can we help? How can we help? And elder, uh, Claudio Costa he came up as a 70 and um, it, to a state conference, a leadership meeting. And I asked the question, how can we help? And it was, a, it was a tricky political subject for the church because the church wanted to welcome Hispanic immigrants into the church, um, include whether they were documented or not. And yet there were also laws um, things like, uh, should we be driving people in our cars or could that create legal problems for church leaders or whatever? And I didn't care about any of that stuff. In my mind, these were brothers and sisters and we just needed to help them. And so, uh, I got this idea that, um, I, I couldn't see a path for them to be legal here. And I thought, we just need to start a business right on the other side of the border of Mexico and go down <laughs> and, and then these people who join the church in Washington, we can just say, come down here, you'll, leg you'll be legal, you'll have economic opportunity, which is why you came to this country in most cases, and we'll start this little Zion. And In northern Mexico? Yeah. Like because right across they the weren't border. legal. So you're you're trying to reconcile Mormons believe in obeying and honoring and sustaining the law. Yeah. So you're baptizing these people into the Lord's true church, but they're not legal, so you don't want to support illegal activity. So your solution in your mind, you started going to the idea of let's get them baptized, but then let's send them back to their country so they're legal, but then help them get a good job. Yeah, yeah so I had this can... vague notion in my head. <laughs> That's cool. It wasn't That's even... sweet, I love it. It made no sense. It was like something a five-year-old would come up with before he knows it's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just had this... <laughs> um, kind of this crazy picture of just starting this community and we would sell stuff. I didn't even have a clear idea. And so I, I quit my job and I started a business and I thought, um, I need to create something that starts making money and then we'd take it across the border and we bring these people down there and, you know, then we're, we're legal and, um, you know, good things are happening. And then I put a second mortgage on my house. And, you know, I was the guy going to the temple every week, Tuesday morning at five was the, the temple session there at the Seattle temple. And um, I thought God was with me. And I thought, I thought I was being guided. And looking back, it sounds kind of crazy now, but maybe you've had an, ex maybe listeners have had an experience like that where, where they tried to do something where they thought there was uh, that God was behind it. And um, in the end, a year later, <laughs> I was in debt. I, my business was failing. And 
I was in a worse position than ever to try to help anybody else because I was so up to my nose in my own problems. And so we moved, um, we moved back to Sandy, Utah and moved in with my wife's parents for a year. Uh, and then my parents for a year, they both live in Sandy, lived in Sandy before we recovered financially enough to be able to get a home again. And um, that one was really hard for me. I, I think that was the first big break in my faith because before that, it it just seemed like if you had faith in God, everything worked out. And and I felt like I had fallen on my face really hard. Was there kind of a, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me kind of feeling? Like, I felt like I was following these promptings, and where were you, Lord? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and the, which turned into a lot of anger. And why am, in my, why am I in the basement of my in-law's house, um, unable to help any of these people I love? You know, when you're trying to do something good, you don't think you have a God complex. But you kind of associate in your mind, this is like Ammon. He went to the Lamanites and all these people got baptized and he loved them. And I kind of felt that way with all these people that uh, we were really close. And I still love these people. Um, and uh, I thought, God, how could I be so deceived? I was going to the temple. I was praying. I was worthy. I was serving. I was... You know, my, um, my stake, I was the elders quorum president and my stake president, um, president dance, a really good guy. We were in an interview once and, um, he kind of got teary eyed and told me that it, he was just kind of complimenting me on, on the work I was trying to do in the, in the ward as the elders quorum president. And so there were all these feedback mechanisms that were telling me that God was happy with me and I'm on the right track. And I thought I was following that. And then I found myself on my face and it was really humiliating. Um, it, it was really humiliating for me. Um, and I say humiliating, not humbling. <laughs> <laughs> it was humiliating um, because I didn't picture myself as the guy who moved into parents' basement, into a parent's basement. I was the guy who was going to do whatever it took to provide for my family like a good priesthood holding man should do. So it, that was a long way of answering. I think your question was something about your first break in your faith. You know, where did it start? And so, and in in what year was that? point where you're living in your parents' basement? Uh, was that early 2005? Okay, so that's 2005, the year, 2006. So that's the year Mormon Stories podcast starts. You're living in your parents' basement in Sandy? Yeah. And you're starting to wonder where is God, basically? Yeah, and <clears throat> once I got back out of kind of feeling in the fire of, you know, having debts pile up and having no income... Um, you know, moving in with parents helped alleviate a lot of that. And so <clears throat> outwardly, I hadn't, I hadn't doubted um, or shared, um, shared such doubts. I tried to just get involved in the ward and, and uh, be a good member. But inwardly, that was where I was having some serious doubts about, you know, could I trust God? And, um, and that was, uh, let's see. So that would have been 2005, 2006. And then we moved into a home. I got involved in, in the ward and this is the home we live in now in Sandy. Um, and again, I like to get involved in my ward. I, I'm a pretty outgoing guy. And um, very quickly, I, I gained a bunch of friends. We gained a bunch of friends in the ward. We had a young family, uh, got very involved, uh, 
you know, involved in the callings and serving and um, for a few years. But then I made, uh, I got to a point again where I thought I needed to start another business. I've had this entrepreneurial bug in me. And um, so far, it hasn't worked out too well in my case. <laughs> and uh, so I had a stable job for a few years, and but then I left it again to start another business. And again, you know, for a while it was going pretty well, and and then, um, well, actually, my wife's probably going to correct on here on order, but it was two thousand November two thousand eight was the brilliant time I decided to start another business. And uh, about the end of that month is when all the news stories about Lehman Brothers and the market crashing and everything uh, started coming out. And so um, then it was hard to find another job. It was hard to get business with the technical consulting I was trying to do. And I was working, I would go out all day uh, on sales appointments and things, and I would um, come home and eat dinner, and then I had eight hours more of work to do to try to fulfill what I was out selling. And so I would often be up till three and four in the morning working, and then I would sleep till seven, and um, it was just kind of this desperate way of living. It was, um, I was exhausted constantly. I always had a Pepsi and, you know, that's a good way to put on 40 pounds, um, is living that way. But I just, it kind of, I kind of became dull. There was my, the whole idea of spirituality, it just got really dull. And I, I think I became very cynical, um, just thinking to myself, where's God when you need him? Like, I'm willing to pivot and change directions, do whatever I need to do. God, just help me know, I think I'm kind of a capable guy. Why do I feel like such a failure? Why do I keep falling on my face? Why do I make my wife not feel safe with me? Because every month she's getting the bills that I'm kind of avoiding. And she's feeling a lot of the stress of that. And I'm just trying to keep my head down staying busy, but not really being productive, just perpetually exhausted and thinking, God, where are you? And I started having this, um, it was a daydream and a night dream regularly. Um, I lived close to a tracks crossing and I knew I didn't want to kill myself, but I did want to, um, I would I would daydream about walking down the street on 106 South and and getting hit by the tracks train and it made me really happy and it was like this peaceful feeling to picture that uh, and then there was this other recurring dream um where up on the Snake River in Idaho, I don't know, you've you've been to Idaho, so you know where the Snake River goes through. There's those big gorges full of lava rocks. And um, and I would picture myself there at night. I was totally naked. And there was like this hangman's, uh, you know, the wooden thing that the hangman's noose hangs from. And it was like creaking and the wind was blowing and the wind and the snow was blowing. And all I wanted to do was put that loop around my neck and jump out over the gorge into the Snake River below. And, and in the dream, I would do that. And right as the rope would snap, I would wake up. And instead of feeling a sense of relief that that wasn't real, I would feel this sense of sadness that it wasn't real. Um, and so it, it was just this weird time and it lasted for about six months where I felt that way. 
And I, I kept trying to do the gospel recipe of, you know, read your scriptures more, serve more, go to the temple, you know, do all those things. And nothing seemed to work and nothing seemed really relevant. And I finally just got to a point where I thought, what if there's no God? What if this church isn't what it claims to be? And still, I, I don't have to change the story now at all. The peace that came over me when I asked those questions in my mind, I can picture right where I was sitting at my desk in my home. Um, it was like what I would call, what church members would call the Holy Ghost. It was this peace that came over me. And I thought, there's no God. This church isn't true. Um, I'm free to look at different ways because my life isn't working right now. And I'm not this kind of person who wants to have dreams about dying in, <laughs> in a gorge at night. I'm an optimist. And so I thought, I need to change I need to change direction. And so that Sunday, I didn't go to church for the first time in memory where I didn't go to church on purpose. And I thought, okay, ball's in your court, God. If you're real, show me. Um, maybe not as, maybe a little more humble than what I just said, but um, I just thought something has got to change. This isn't, this isn't working. And... And surprisingly, I was expecting to feel a sense of like loss or maybe the spirit would withdraw from me or something because I'm sinning. But instead, I just felt really good. I was like, no church. I have a time I can sleep. And uh, <laughs> days became weeks, became months. Um, and the church just, and God um, I think anybody who's gone through that, it, it's not something I think that happens for most of us in a one-time way. You have that moment where you feel that way, and then a couple days later, you're like, sorry, God, I'm going to pray even harder, and I'm going to be even better, and I apologize for being rebellious, and show me the way back to thee, because you have to speak in the language of Scripture, you can't talk normal, and... Uh, but you do that over and over. Would you call that bargaining? You're the psychologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bargain. <laughs> bargaining. Yeah. yeah. It's a stage of grief. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it became, the periods where I would feel that sense of trying to recoup what I had got bigger and bigger to where I finally just, I really didn't care about it. And uh, that's how I stopped believing in God and the church. And I didn't know anything about church history or any of the stuff that's that's talked about so much on on podcasts in this genre. But you, okay, so did you then feel like you needed to have a conversation with your wife or your dad or your brothers or your Oh, siblings? the whole time I was talking with them, my wife, my parents, my bishop, um, this wasn't something I sprung on them. This was something over multiple years. Um, it, it was just gradually happening. And so once they got a real clear sense that you were done with the church, what was their response? I'm hesitant to, I'm just going to talk in generalities because I don't want to speak for somebody. Um, one of the things I feel passionate about as somebody who's in the church is when you leave the church the whole experience can be defined by fear. But at some point, you hit a threshold where people can see you're not going to be rescued and you're not going to do what they might perceive as the right thing. And I think that's a lot of point, a lot of the, that point where a lot of marriages end. Um, thankfully, um, mine didn't. Um, but the ward, the, which one thing unique, I've lived in the same ward for 15 years. And, um, when I left, I, 
I felt very close to a lot of people. And one thing I hope we as members of the church can get better at is being friends with people, even if they're not going to come back. Um, because there were people I didn't see for seven years and I lived a block away from them or two blocks away from them. Um, with about two or three exceptions, um, it's like my ward disappeared. And I don't say this to point a criticizing finger at them, but I, I try to understand why did that happen? And um, as one who's back in the church, I kind of feel a calling. I want to reach out to those people who, even if they're never going to be involved in the ward, even if they leave the church and they're never coming back, to me, we need to learn how to be close friends with people who aren't in our church. Lifelong friends, not friends that where we're really friendly for a period of time in hopes of shaping somebody's behavior. Um, that leaves the, the worst taste in people's mouth when they feel like <laughs> all that friendship that was shown uh, could just disappear so easily. Um, when you leave the church, it's easy to, maybe people in the church have fear about who you are now. How did you lose your faith? And maybe you have fear about, were all these relationships even real? Right, <laughs> right down to my mom and dad um, and my wife. I spent two years unable to believe that my own mom and dad and my wife could love me. I thought it was totally conditional upon me being able to someday come back to the church. Um, and that's all about fear. And even though that was what I was perceiving and I could go to a support group you know, a Mormon stories podcast community in Salt Lake, we could meet at a restaurant and we could all tell our stories or I could invite people to my house or go to other people's houses. But those stories get told over and over the fear of broken relationships and the pain of broken relationships. And, um, it becomes kind of a self fulfilling prophecy you see everybody around you and you start to see everybody within the church that you loved for decades of your life and that loved you as somehow these shallow people that you can only talk about sports and the weather with because the moment you want to talk about all your reasons to justify yourself for leaving the church, they don't want to talk about it and it makes them uncomfortable and it makes them mad and, and, you know, we can, try to, we can try to impose those kinds of conversations on our family. I used to be the king of sending out email to everybody on both sides of the family with all these hard questions um, that there was no answer to. And um, <laughs> I would be really frustrated when people wouldn't engage with me. I would think, oh, a bunch of Mormons, a bunch of sheep. They don't even know their history. They don't even know the, about these questions. And, and they're just so scared they don't want to address. They don't want truth. They want loyalty to the group. And I would feel mad. And I would feel lonely and isolated. And, uh, you know, this is a pattern. A, a lot of people listening to this are going to understand very well. <laughs> so did you ever... Did you ever get communication from your parents or siblings that you were second class or second rate or were a disappointment? And I know you don't want to call anyone out. Yeah. But did you did you feel 
either disappointment and or disapproval and or rejection from your parents or siblings for your decisions? Your question is, did I feel it Ex- uh, very much? I felt so isolated except for my one angel brother. Well, I have two angel brothers. One's alive and one's dead. Um, <laughs> my one brother who was out with me, we were each other's safe place. Um, but uh, I felt so distant from my family. And my family was really close growing up. <laughs> I felt... Um, I look at my kids now. <laughs> You've watched a child come into the world, your child, and and you know you could never stop loving them, even if you're mad at them, even if you disagree with them and think they're doing stupid things. You know you never stop loving them. But when we're when everybody's feeling fear, we can act in ways that are perceived as. Uh, you know, I could point to an instance. Oh, my dad said this to me, and it offended me deeply. And I could point to that one point in time, and that would be my little fact proving my case. But it's not the truth. <laughs> and uh, the truth comes over time. And there are going to be Years of two, three, five years of clashes in relationships and difficulties and times where you feel like you can never have a heart-to-heart conversation because everybody feels fear about it. And uh, I would just say in this community, as in Mormon stories, we need to talk more. Those of us who are 5, 10, 15 years down the road need to talk more to the people who are one, two, three years down the road and tell them with a hug, don't give up on those fat, the people who love you most. They might be saying things that are hurtful right now, and you might be saying hurtful things to them, but don't give up on those relationships because in 10 years, those people you met at the Mormon stories group at Red Robin or whatever, they're probably not going to be in your life. But the your siblings, your parents, your in-laws, and your extended family, um, those are your support group for life. And those are relationships, even if it's hard, worth rebuilding. And those are relationships that when you feel isolated and alone and hurt, it's hard to see those recovering. Um, I, I used to... Some people may have seen the show Wallander. Um, I'm not on a total tangent. It, there's a Swedish version and a British version. And the Swedish version has this, what is it, a cello or something that's really discordant sounding is the theme music. And it's all dark and Wallander's this guy who kind of solves crimes. And he's in this atheist country. And I used to fantasize about just leaving my family and going to Sweden Eastad Sweden, where Wallander lived, this fictional character, because I just wanted to escape, because I didn't feel hope, that uh, it was hard for me to believe that my wife could ever love me again. Um, and I want to be sensitive to those where this has ended in divorce and it has ended in in permanent separations. Um I love you, and I'm sorry that that's happened to you. I'm not trying to come across as self-righteous like I have the answers. Um, But there are a lot of you that are in sleep next to somebody who you feel a million miles apart from, and you wonder... You know, you married her or him because of the church that brought you together, and now it feels impossible, or maybe a spouse has given you some kind of ultimatum to go to church, or she's going to divorce you, or whatever, and it's really, really painful, but uh, I just want to (laughs) convey, look five, ten years ahead, and if it's possible for that relationship to... um, 
to work. Um, I, I want to be really careful here <laughs> because you know your situ- people know their situation better than I do, and it's not going to turn out the same for everybody. What, but, I, what I'm kind of asking, yeah. and I put out this question to Facebook just a few days ago. I've experienced some family shunning, uh, not a lot, but there are some family members that haven't spoken to me or my family in years uh, in one way or another, and it's been deeply, deeply painful and hurtful. And and so I put out on Facebook, just curious to hear other people's experiences. And you just hear, you know, you hear parents that stop speaking to their kid. You know, I, I had people write in like, my dad hasn't spoken to me in five years, or my spouse left me and took the kids, or, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm a grandparent and my children won't won't allow their children to be around me, that, you know, their grandparents anymore, or... Uh, you know, and that's kind of the hard shunning. And then the soft shunning is like things like you're a disappointment. I wish you had been dead or I, I would have rather. That seems pretty hard too. I would have been told that <laughs> I would have rather been told that, you know, that, that I had cancer, that you had cancer than, than know that you lost your faith. And then there's even the softer stuff, which is like not including you on text strings or not inviting you to the baptisms or, you know, the different ordinances. There's a lot of different ways that, and grades of shunning within Mormonism. And I guess what I was just trying to get at is, and it sounds like what you're saying is you felt separate from your parents and your siblings and your wife, but it sounds like they weren't engaging in a lot of that shunning behavior. You just felt, you just felt distance from them. You make... You make loved ones a proxy for the church. When you're really mad at the church and your wife or your parents affirm their loyalty to the church, then it's hard to separate those two. And so it's like if a uh, one person has commented to me on Facebook, um, something like, how can you... Um, how can you go back to a church that uh, that's so brutal to gay people? And and so in the mind, implicit in the question is that if I'm involved in the church, that I am an active participant um, in hurting gay people, um, or you know other populations within the church that. Um, you might say women in the past or even maybe present, you might say black people, you might, you know, there, there are populations within the church that have felt, um, hurt by it. And so back to this idea of my parents could have done nothing to try to shun me. And I could have still felt shunned by them because in my mind, they represented the church and I wanted to be as far as possible from the church. And so everything I interpreted that they did, and that's not to say people don't say real things that hurt or, you know, comments trying to understand your behavior and, you know, saying somehow Satan's got a hold on you or, and it's like, no, no. <laughs> Satan does not have a hold on me. I am a good person. I'm trying to do the right things in my life. And don't tell me that (laughs) the epitome of evil is controlling everything I do. You know, that kind of stuff is hard to hear. Um, For somebody who's sincerely trying to to follow their conscience. Um, But there is a period of pain there and sensitivity where even if a person does nothing, it feels like they're doing something. You know, if they haven't talked to you in a week, it feels like, are they um, are they avoiding me on purpose? And then, now, there's again, there's some reality to it. It's not just, this isn't gaslighting, this isn't making things up. Uh, members of the church, when they see somebody who's going to leave, they feel scared. Because that is, that's the belief, you know, you want everybody to 
go back to heaven together. And when people are scared, we aren't our best selves and we do horrible things. And just because we did a horrible thing or said a horrible thing, that's not the whole truth of a relationship. That is, that is a moment where people need to say sorry to each other and, and hug. And maybe that can't happen for years, but it, a person's worst moment isn't the truth of who they are totally. And so what I hear you kind of saying is that there really is a, there's two, at least two things that are happening. One is, is the explicit, uh, or the backhanded sort of, uh, things that people do to either express dissatisfaction or to shun you or to separate from you, uh, or to just d disappear out of your life, whether it's family or ward members or whatever. And there's this whole grade of ways that people can react from super kind and loving to like complete shunning to saying mean things and all sorts of shades in between. But even if everybody were just totally normal, what we all bring is this layer of probably guilt, of fear, of shame, of conditioning where you'll, you'll read in and project onto everyone's behavior your worst fears, your anger, your frustration, your sadness, yeah. so that you could, you'll be reading and perceiving people's behavior as being antagonistic or unloving or unkind, even if they're totally acting like they always did. You, you kind of fill in the blanks and color it. Yes. And everyone's going to have probably different degrees of both, of both layers, yeah. right? I think a lot of people have gone to the Sunday family dinner and they're wanting to talk about something hard, but there's nieces and nephews there, whatever, if you have an extended family in the area and nobody wants to talk about your issues at that moment, <laughs> but you, that's the only thing you want to talk about. And so it can create some conflict. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that, I, I think that completes my thought there. Just um, we need to have hope, and we need to have hope both on the side of within the church where I'm at now, and within this uh, in ex Mormon communities. We need to have hope that relationships can be good. And we need to trust that people who have loved us for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They might be doing some hurtful things, or you might be perceiving it that way as you leave the church. Don't give up on those relationships. They're still the key people in your life. John DeLynn is not the key person in your life. Um, you might hold a support group once a month or something, but you're not the day-to-day -day support in people's life, and it's most likely families and longtime friends that are the right people to be that. And so let's talk about how to make those relationships better when they're hurting instead of writing those off as lost relationships.